Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, What is the West? My name is Winston Brady, and it is my pleasure to be here today with Josh Herring to talk through what makes the Western canon so unique. The goal of these Daily Express webinars is to promote the values and virtues of classical education with a space for teachers to share insights, resources, teaching tips, and encourage each other in the weighty task of classical education. So this webinar is being recorded and it will be re released on our Thales Press YouTube channel and our Developing Classical Thinkers podcast. That way you can easily find everything that is said on this particular webinar once it's recorded. Q&A will follow over Zoom through the Zoom chat box, as well as through the Q&A portion in your Zoom window. To give some background, Josh Herring is the Dean of Classical Education at our Thales Academy Apex Campus. He has taught almost every humanities class at Thales and is also the director of our debate program, which helps to coordinate debate tournaments in the Raleigh area. Josh gave this lecture last year to a group of 12th grade students for a senior seminar class at Thales, a class where the students are asked to write a substantial thesis-driven argumentative paper as part of the graduation requirements that they have at Thales. The lecture was so good, I asked Josh to come and present the talk as a webinar. So Josh, thank you very much for taking the time to deliver this talk on so important a subject. And I'll go ahead and hand off the webinar now to Josh Herring. Thank you, Winston, for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, by way of, uh, I guess, one last bit of context, mm -hmm. uh, I was struck one day when I asked my seniors to uh, define the Western tradition and discovered that they had trouble doing that. And I, I was kind of taken aback because that is something that's very core to our curriculum at Thales Academy. And I discovered as I continued talking to my students that it was as much the vocabulary as, as it was the content that they needed to connect. So that, that's really the impetus behind today's lecture. So with that, uh, I'm going to read this. And uh, I'm sure at some point, uh, Winston will publish out the actual text. If that's of any interest to anyone, I'm also happy to email that uh, to anybody who would find that of use. So with that. Here we go. Okay. One of my favorite passages in literature comes from Evelyn Waugh's post-World War II novel, Bride's Head Revisited. Waugh uses the reminiscence of his protagonist, Charles Ryder, to contrast two different educations. The traditional education he received and the modern progressive education his junior officer, Hooper, received. Quote, Hooper had no illusions about the army, or rather, no special illusions distinguishable from the general enveloping fog from which he observed the universe. He had come to it reluctantly, under compulsion, after he had made every feeble effort in his power to obtain deferment. He accepted it, he said, like the measles. Hooper was no romantic. He had not, as a child, ridden with Rupert's horses or sat among the campfires at Xanthus' side, at the age when my eyes were dry to all save poetry, that stoic, red-skinned interlude which our schools introduce between the fast-flowing tears of the child and the man, Hooper had wept often, but never for Henry's speech on St. Crispin's Day, nor for the epitaph at Thermopylae. The history they taught him had had few battles in it, but instead a profusion of detail about humane legislation and recent industrial changes. Gallipoli, Balaclava, Quebec, Lepanto, Bannockburn, Roncevalles, and Marathon. These and the battle in the West where Arthur fell and a hundred names whose trumpet notes even now, in my seer and lawless state, called to me irresistibly across the intervening years, with all the clarity and strength of boyhood, sounded in vain to Hooper. You see, Charles' education prepared him in a way to see himself as part of a story, a story that reached back to the mythic past and continued into history. This story <clears throat> was made up of a mix of fact and romance. For the one who knew the tale, the names in that paragraph conjure up certain images. Roland weeping over Olivier's corpse and sounding his horn one last time to recall Charlemagne to defeat the Moors at Roncesvalles, Arthur dead on the field of Camlan, and with him the hope of a peaceful England. Those lines recalling the heroic death of 300 Spartans. Go tell the Spartans, stranger passing by, that here, obedient to their laws, we lie. Hooper hears none of it. The tragic deaths, the courageous embrace of something beyond oneself, the call for civilization. I say all of this as a beginning to a lecture on the nature of the Western tradition. Today, we're not Socratizing. <clears throat> we're not treating this as a Q&A session. Today, I want to explain something that matters, something vital to your happiness as a human being. I want to describe your intellectual inheritance. 
As students at Thales Academy, you all come from a variety of backgrounds. No matter where you come from or your family's financial position, you stand on the cusp of a certain inheritance. Today, I want to map out that inheritance. Like many abstract concepts, this inheritance, this Western civilization, Western tradition, sometimes just called the great tradition, has a practical side as well. One of your thesis requirements is connecting your topic and research to the Western tradition. The first three years that senior seminar existed as a class, I taught that class. Each year, students were puzzled by this phrase, the Western tradition. I, in turn, was puzzled at their confusion. How can you attend a classical school for somewhere between four and 12 years and not know what you're in? The fault is not in you, the students, but in us, your teachers. We've not always done a good job describing the whole. <laughs> Today, I want to describe the whole. It is, of course, made up of many parts. The parts are all fascinating and we could get sidetracked, waylaid by understandable curiosity. My goal is to avoid distractions. I want to avoid claiming to give the final word on the Western tradition. By the end of today's lecture, I hope you have a clear picture of this tradition and can perceive the pieces of it in your education, your nation, and your soul. You are poorly served by this moment in time. Beginning in 1968, it became passe to mock the tradition as the reading of, quote, old dead white men. Today, the tradition is being literally dismantled by the very culture that it built, replacing Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day, tearing down statues of flawed humans, rejecting requirements in college course sequences to the extent that it's now normal to graduate from college without encountering either Shakespeare or the U.S. Constitution. The replacement of consideration of unifying human universals with ever more precise particulars, searching for, quote, indigenous approaches to physics. These are all normal parts of our contemporary discourse. Your colleges will most likely <clears throat> be ready to dismiss the value of the West. It matters that you be able to at least understand the tradition and I hope be ready to defend it. Before we launch into five key elements of the Western tradition, permit me to recommend two books that have shaped my understanding of this subject. Uh, those are on this first slide. The first book I wanna recommend is The Great Tradition by Dr. Richard Gamble. In The Great Tradition, Dr. Gamble gathers readings from across the Western tradition that are tied to a particular strand of this tradition, the growth of the liberal arts as a paradigm for education. His subtitle is instructive, classic readings on what it means to be an educated human being. Dr. Gamble is a professor of intellectual history at Hillsdale College and a primary example of what it means to be a scholar, a teacher, and an heir of the West. The second book I wanna mention is by Dr. Russell Kirk, The Roots of the American Order. Dr. Kirk <coughs> attempted to write out the elements of Western civilization that combined to form the United States of America. He does a great job weaving together hundreds of texts, ideas, events, and artifacts into a coherent whole. He structures his book around the key city for each civilization that he studies. I'm gonna borrow the structure for the rest of my talk from Dr. Kirk. The Western tradition is hard to define precisely. So I'm gonna borrow some metaphors developed over the centuries. English political thinker Edmund Burke refers to it as the great contract between three parties, the dead, the living, and the yet to be born. The living receive an existing body of institutions, knowledge, and ways of living. With this gift comes the responsibility to receive it, to take care of it, and to pass it on to the next generation. Perhaps we could also think of the Western tradition as an ongoing construction project like the cathedrals of the Middle Ages. A cathedral often took a century to build, Given the short lifespan of many medieval Europeans, multiple generations of people put their work into Notre Dame and Chartres Cathedral. Uh, in this case, Western civilization is something you are born into, that you get to contribute to and will continue long after you die. This tradition develops progressively. Each generation adds to the complexity of the whole. Not everything survives. The tradition is composed of absences as much as present things. But those pieces that are added uh, are those that each previous generation found worthwhile. The Gothic cathedral developed as an architectural articulation of medieval belief that life is oriented beyond itself. The cathedral summons each person to recognize his smallness in contrast to God. It is a way of reaching towards the transcendent. The great tradition works similarly. Each generation has found something transcendent in considering the common sense learned by humanity as a whole. The tradition is not something any one person has developed, but instead it is the gathering together of the collected wisdom of humanity. 
That collected wisdom reaches beyond the mundane world into the transcendent realm of ideas. The enduring nature of this tradition is tied to its ability to help each generation lift their eyes to perceive something beyond the physical, and in so doing, nourish life in this world. For the next few minutes, I want to walk through elements of the Western tradition that we get from each of five distinct civilizations. And I'm going to refer to each civilization by its key city. And we're going to start with ancient Greece. While the Greeks don't come first chronologically, they seem to me to make the most sense to start with because it is from the Greeks that we get the clearest articulation of human nature. While recognizing many levels of distinction between people, the Greeks developed a distinction between physis, nature, and nomos, custom, that resulted in a philosophical quest to discover the nature of things as distinct from the customs which each people developed. The Greeks are taken as the beginning of the West because they are the first to consistently argue that certain things are true of all humans, that there is, in fact, something called human nature. Aristotle does this most clearly. All humans, he argued, are rational, and we share language as a fruit of rationality. Though there might be all kinds of distinctions between people, slave and free, the civilized Greeks and the barbaroi, or the other non-Greek peoples, male and female, all humans share this rationality. Because we have reason, we can learn about the world around us. Reason is the basis for wonder, which in turn gives rise to philosophical reasoning. As far as we know, there was nothing particularly special about the Greeks, but they were the first to articulate this view of a universal human nature. Such a view shaped their literature in a profound way. Even though Greek myth is unique to the Greeks, it draws upon the natural world in such a way that, time out of mind, different cultures have resonated with it. Greek drama uses the particular details of character and place, Oedipus and Thebes, Orestes and Athens, to address universal human questions of crime, evil, justice, and fate. While the Greeks also developed key philosophical, architectural, and political structures, certain principles have come down to us today through their literature. I want to briefly list the ones I suspect you remember from your time in ninth grade literature. Let's start with the Nine Muses. Now, these goddesses were thought to be the source of human creativity and represent the Greek conviction that survival alone is not enough. Life should be beautiful, and through music, poetry, dance, and art, life is made better than it otherwise could be. The muses are a representation of what Russell Kirk referred to as the unbought grace of life. We could live in an ugly, utilitarian world fit only for survival. Instead, we live in a world where beauty is. And we as humans have the capacity to elevate and celebrate that beauty. These concepts the Greeks symbolized through the Muses. But there's also the Furies. Now the Greeks believe there's an order to reality. When that order is violated, nature demands punishment. They symbolize this, symbolize this demand through the Furies, the implacable women who avenged Clytemnestra after Orestes kills her. The demand for justice is universal, but accomplishing that justice is never an easy or simple process. The Greeks symbolized this human thirst and the disastrous results of unmitigated justice through the Furies. Patricide, matricide, and uh, we'll just say sleeping with one's mother are crimes, not because they violate local custom. These actions violate physis, and as such, nature itself cries out for redress. Now, Homeric poetry resounds with many truths, but today I want to recall only two. Remember Achilles' rage and the disaster that it caused. Anger can ruin the work of many years, and unchecked, it is a force that causes nations and lives to crumble. Balance this image against the picture of Odysseus's wiles. Through wit, the man of twists and turns can overcome the gods and find his way home again. Pair these together and we have an image of the human person, constantly working to hold his impulses at bay through reason. And through reason, such a human can overcome obstacles to accomplish his goals. Greek civilization passes on many other aspects to the tradition, but perhaps the greatest of them is the Platonic sense of wonder and the need to explore the totality of the real. Plato's Socrates shows us that we are deceived about many things that we think we know, and it belongs to the realm of rational humans to spend their lives seeking truth in community through dialogue. So from the Greeks, we inherit a concept of universal human nature as rational, a vision of life as about more than mere survival, and twin literatures focusing on the imagination and on the mind. A Rome is a much different civilization from Greece. The Romans are often characterized as practical, engineers rather than poets. The Romans conquered Greece when they began expanding. They adopted Greek culture as their own. 
Roman philosophy does not really add much to Greek philosophy, and Roman literature is largely derivative of Greek poets. That being said, the Romans add enormous pieces to our intellectual heritage. Rome is the story of a single city. <clears throat> Mythically founded by Romulus and Remus, it begins in murder and matures through rape and kidnapping. In the midst of this violent city, the sharp class divisions between the patricians and the plebeians necessitated something new in the world, a written law code. Hammurabi had written his, law, his code earlier, and Moses had already received the Ten Commandments. But for Rome, the beginning of the law was the Twelve Tables. Written out in common Latin so that all could see, the Twelve Tables established a common framework within which all Romans could operate. From then forward, the concept of Roman law was of a clear, universally understandable law. Citizens of Rome were protected by her law. Those outside of the law at least knew where they stood. Life under a common law fostered Rome's military expansion. Everywhere the legions went, certain parts of Roman custom followed. A clear law code, roads, and Roman-style architecture. Even in the wilds of Britain can be found Roman mosaics and remnants of camps where legionaries defended Roman territories from attack. Greece offered a vision of universal human nature. Rome developed as a vision of a universal human life. All peoples living under the same law code, governed by just rulers, protected by the mightiest legions in the world, with easy commerce across the Mediterranean Sea, the Mare Nostrum, and roads all secured by Roman legions. For a thousand years, the dream of Rome attained some level of reality. The sayings, Pax Romana and All Roads Lead to Rome, both capture this reality and express the remnant of it. For a time, Rome was the center of the Mediterranean world economically, politically, and militarily. Roman history contains certain stories that add Roman virtues to the tradition. Hopefully, you've heard the story of Caesar crossing the Rubicon, combining courage and bravery with a certain trusting to fate. Cincinnatus returning to his farm, rejecting absolute power when he could have seized it. Horatius at the bridge, ready to die for his city. These stories and others like them have for centuries encouraged protection of the home, right ambition, boldness, courage, and the goodness of dying for a noble cause. From Rome, we also derive the, a sense of the division of powers in the government. The Senate, made up of patricians, held the ultimate power in the Republic. Eventually, the consulate evolved into the role of emperor. How the emperor related to the military and the Senate often became one of the most important questions of a given period of Roman history. Roman history also shows the power of the plebeian class and the famous method of dealing with them, bread and circuses. The people, amused and docile, were resistant to change. For Roman leaders to continue in power, it was often more important to pacify the mob than to effect real change. In the 18th century, Edward Gibbon wrote The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. His work crystallized a long-standing tradition of using Rome as the paradigm for considering the life cycle of a nation. Founding, rise, plateau, collapse. Gibbon asserted that Rome rose by virtue and fell by vice, lending his historical analysis to the argument that the virtue of a people contributes to their political strength. From Rome, the tradition gains a practical aspect. Roads, commerce, governance all matter. Rome also adds a dream, a world composed of people speaking the same language, governed by the same laws, seeking the common good. The successes and failure of Rome continue to be a mainstay in education, in part because Rome is the paradigm of a nation's life cycle. A parallel in the course of Greco-Roman development lies the nation of Israel, symbolized through their holy city of Jerusalem. Jesus famously said that man does not live by bread alone. One might argue that Jerusalem belongs in this account because man does not live by physical sustenance or rational proposition alone. Jewish civilization did not contribute architecture, military victories, or technological innovation. Instead, the Hebrew civilization adds a religious dimension to the Western tradition. The source material for this contribution is the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, commonly known in the Gentile world as the Old Testament. Jerusalem was conquered by the second king of unified Israel, David, after he and his men snuck into the city through the sewage pipes and killed the original inhabitants. David made it the capital of his kingdom, and from then until now, Jerusalem has been the religious and political center of the Abrahamic faiths. Because of David's conquering, Jerusalem is often called the city of David. The Hebrew account of humanity's origins stand in sharp contrast to other ancient Near Eastern accounts. 
Rather than human beings being made to be slaves of the gods, as in the Enuma Elish, or living in terror of the gods, according to both Hesiod and Homer, Genesis confers a unique dignity on humans. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that lives on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. It's Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. Now, this passage does at least two things. It establishes humans as bearing the divine image, and it establishes ontological equality between men and women. Notice that key word, ontological, referring to their essence. In their essence, men and women have equality of value not because of what they've done, but because they are made in the divine image. That ontological equality does not necessarily mean positional interchangeability in a society. Different cultures have handled masculine and feminine roles in various ways across the centuries. Varying levels of technology make masculine strength, considering physiological bone and muscle structure that enable agricultural production, that's more or less essential dependent on the technology available. But Genesis provides a clear rationale for saying that all humans are equal in value regardless of what they do, or how abled or disabled they might be. They are valuable simply by virtue of their humanity. This principle is the foundation within the tradition for two more contemporary, move two more contemporary movements, abolition of slavery in the West and women's equality. Both take a long time to come to fruition. But they start with this basic principle of ontological equality established in Genesis 1, 26 through 28. We get the idea of all men are created equal, not originally from Jefferson, but rather from Genesis. The assumption of human dignity pairs neatly alongside a Roman conception of universal law, giving rise to at least one philosophical account of human rights. Jerusalem's second contribution to the tradition comes from its ethics. The Judaic view of morality is governed by three principles. Right and wrong actions in the Hebrew view are not determined by us, the human actors, but rather by first, our obligation to God as creator, second, our obligation to each other as being possessed of dignity, and thirdly, creatures with reason able to apply divine commands or universals in specific context, often much more particular. Right behavior is a standard of conduct set for creatures by the creator. This principle is the backbone of the Jewish law, the Torah. And yet, throughout the Jewish law code, an ethic of love governs all actions. The greatest commandment reads, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second greatest commandment is like unto it, Love your neighbor as yourself. While in one sense an action's rightness is based on adherence to the command, Thou shalt not steal, the rationale behind not stealing is a violation of love. When I steal, I harm not only my neighbor, but myself as well. Judicial action flows out of an awareness of these principles. The history of the Jewish people is the history of adapting these laws and customs to different times and places. Because of the divine image, we have the rationality to reason through the connection between love of neighbor and a requirement to maintain good property condition. If my neighbor is harmed by the bull that escapes because I fail to maintain my fence, that ultimately is my fault. Here is the beginning of a universal ethic of love based on the dignity of the person made in the image of God, an ethic that pairs neatly with the Greek concept of physis. The third contribution the Hebrews made to the tradition is an unflinching monotheism. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The conception of a single, personable God who is knowable, who speaks in a way that humans can understand, this god stands in stark contrast to the anthropomorphic gods of Greece and Rome. Greece and Rome imagine gods who enact the best and worst of human behavior on an epic scale. The Hebrews say that God is so holy that anyone who approaches him in the wrong way will be destroyed by holy fire. The Jews tell stories of this god who tells Moses, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Now here we encounter a point of tension in the tradition. After all, the Greeks and the Romans worshipped many gods. They would gladly have accepted Yahweh into their list of deities, as they did with Egyptian deities like Isis or Near Eastern ones like Mithras, except that Yahweh demands to be worshipped exclusively. Yahweh alone is God. All others are lies, deceptions who cannot stand in the face of this God who made all that is in six days and then rested. 
Jewish history is largely the history of a people who believe in intolerable truth. Every time they confront a polytheistic people, they are forced to hold to their God. In Judaism, we have an unshakable truth claim. If it is right, it is a claim worth dying for. Like the Greeks and the Romans, the Jews have plenty of cultural artifacts you should know. I want to list a few of these. The first of those is the temple. I'm sorry. The first of those is the temple. Originally built by Solomon in Jerusalem, the temple was the center of Hebrew worship. Here is the literal place where Jews would go to meet their God, who is literally believed to be in the Holy of Holies on the mercy seat of the tabernacle. The destruction of the temple in AD 70 by the Romans effectively dispersed the Jewish community, resulting in a global diaspora. In a very real sense, the Jews are the people united by the worship of Yahweh at the temple. Orthodox Judaism today anticipates the rebuilding of the temple in modern-day Jerusalem. A second artifact I wanted to discuss is the prophets. Now, these were the people who proclaimed the word of Yahweh to the Jews. The term primarily refers to Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, alongside many others. In their writings, we get the full flowering of the ethic of love and the hope of redemption. The prophets were told the coming of Messiah, the one who would make it possible to truly love God and love people with whole hearts. Ezekiel has the image of this taking place by the replacement of a heart of stone with a heart of flesh, a heart unable to beat with love, with a heart that literally moves with love. The prophets contain various visions of a, of a perfected world. Isaiah famously writes about a time when the lion will lie down with the lamb, when the sword will be beaten into a plowshare, a world where there is no more war, only peace, a place where everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. The prophet Daniel gives an account of the future in cryptic symbols, Endless fun has been had trying to align these visions with Alexander the Great's empire, with Rome, with the British Empire, with America, and many others. The last piece I want to mention uh, that you should know is the term Golgotha. Golgotha is the hill outside Jerusalem where Jesus was crucified. For Christians, this is the site of Messiah's death and the price and the place where the where the blood price for redeeming humanity was paid. Two more things should be said about Jerusalem. First, note that it is and has been the spiritual center for all the spiritual descendants of Abraham. For the Jews, this is the capital of their land, the place promised by God to Abraham as a perpetual inheritance. For Christians, it is the place where Christ died and rose again, the place where he will return to reign in power and glory. For Muslims, this is the place where Muhammad ascended and will one day return. The Dome of the Rock commemorates this moment in Muslim belief. Three of the five major world religions consider Jerusalem sacred space. Secondly, if Greece teaches us about the universality of human reason and Rome the idea of a universal law, Jerusalem points us to the universality of the human spirit. The spiritual side of human beings is significant. The most important questions concern the nature of God, the nature of humanity, and the relationship between the two. Some things we know by reason, but what lies beyond the rational? What room does reason allow for the human experience of the mystical, the mysterious, for that which is beyond verbal expression? Jerusalem adds to the Western tradition and awareness of the spiritual side of human nature. Think of Athens, Rome, and Jerusalem as the building blocks. By the 5th century AD, the world of antiquity was in the process of collapsing and giving birth to something new. Europe is a civilization born out of the swirling together of the three previous civilizations, combined with the energy of the Germanic peoples and the church's attempt to create order. In that combination, much that was normative in the Mediterranean world of the third century AD was lost forever. The synthesis gave rise to the European civilization that persists to this day. I'm using two cities and a uh, sense of broader Europe to symbolize this European civilization in part because there is not a single country called Europe. Europe is an idea, the joining together of the nations that once were part of the Roman Empire with those that survived Rome. Over the centuries, these countries have variously referred to themselves as the Holy Roman Empire, uh, famously as Voltaire quipped, neither Roman nor holy, nor an empire. Uh, they've also been called the Hanseatic League and most recently the European Union and the Schengen area. Europe as a continent works to the extent that it does because it shares a common civilizational origin and aim. The desire for a universal civilization emerged in the reigns of both Charlemagne, uh, first Holy Roman Emperor, and Alfred the Great, the defender of England against the Danes. 
Both sought to unify their realms, and they did so with an appeal to Roman ancestry and present Christian faith. The largest unifying force in medieval Europe was, without a doubt, the Catholic Church. Based out of the center of the old world, the papacy provided various forces of unity. Latin became the common language of both religious practice and scholarship. The liturgies of the Catholic confession created common experiences and conviction that eventually shaped the legal codes of various countries. By the high Middle Ages, a common orthodoxy, meaning right belief, had resulted in convictions about the nature of orthopraxy, or right behavior. As we emerge into the modern era, Europe was the site of several key transformations new in the world. Universities became the place for higher education. Theology, philosophy, and the liberal arts were eventually complemented by the development of legal, medical, and other studies. The conception of knowledge as one, as one study through a multiplicity of approaches, gave rise to the university as a single place that was unified by a diversity of ways to study knowledge. We also see the rise of the nation state. Medieval feudalism gave way to centralized monarchies, whether in their constitutional or absolutist forms. With the fading of feudalism arose the beginnings of a free lower and middle class no longer tied to land through serfdom. The growth of contemporary economics enabled monarchies to collect more taxes, facilitating the development of the nation state. Rule of law shifted from being embodied in single individuals like Charles I or Henry II to transcending the life of any particular person through an administrative state. We also see the cessation of religious conflict. The wars of religion gave way to the Peace of Westphalia in 1648. While religious conflict still occurred, the collective heads of state gathered at Westphalia agreed, and largely kept to their agreement, that religious identification as Catholic or Protestant would no longer be justification for war. We also saw changing conceptions of knowledge. The success of the scientific revolution in uncovering more accurate understandings of the world gave rise to the Enlightenment, an intellectual rejection of tradition and non-scientific knowledge. Europe also witnessed a new philosophy of government. Government founded not on the divine right of kings, but instead on human collaboration. With English, French, and German authors, all in some kind of agreement, the idea of society is moving from a state of nature to an established uh, to an established collaboration made by common consent, whether that was conscious or unconscious, really became mainstream. Underneath these vast historical movements lie a series of previous civilizational accomplishments. The dignity of the human person, the assertion of human rationality, and the growth of the scientific mentality as a true way to study the world, that all of this began in antiquity and survived through the centuries to give rise to their current expressions in modernity. All right, Civilization V brings us to the United States of America. Now, the United States was called at its inception a grand experiment. Could a group of 13 former colonies successfully govern themselves? Could they develop a system of mutual prosperity? Or would they instead devolve into constant warfare, barbarism, and tyranny? Fortunately, thus far, the American experiment has been a success. Without embracing a progressive view of history, I think it is legitimate to see the American experiment as developing out of the different civilizational elements that came before. The founding fathers were well-versed in Greco-Roman and European history. Religiously, they knew the scriptures and the moral ethos that would create a thriving society. Part of the success of the American experiment lies in taking what is best from previous traditions while working to avoid bringing along unworthy baggage. For example, the constitutional commitment to religious liberty enshrines the dignity of the conscience at the heart of the American Constitution resulting in a pluralistic society where the positive freedom to associate religiously neither obligates such association nor forbids religious practice. The American founders and their descendants managed to take the best of enlightenment thinking, concepts like John Locke's social compact theory and Adam Smith's ideas about the study of economics without bringing in the excesses that brought about famine and terror in the French Revolution. Melding Aristotle with Locke, the framers built a federal model of government that effectively divided powers, legislative, executive, and judicial, while respecting the different levels of government that already existed, local, state, and federal. Such a system was constructed with maximal possibility for self-government. After all, as James Madison argued, the American people were a moral people who understood the ethic of the Judeo-Christian worldview. Without that foundation, the American people would require a much more authoritarian state. And yet, this new nation did need a government. If men were angels, Madison thought, they would be perfectly just. 
Men are not angels. There must be a government to wield the sword and establish the good of the whole. Over time, the American story is one of working out the implications of human dignity inherent in the human person. Both the Hebrew concept of the Imago Dei, the image of God, and the Greek conception of humanity as universally rational imply that slavery is unjust. Change is not easy. Over time, through a civil war, slavery left the American economy. Over time, through legislative changes, women's equality also became normative in American practice. The pieces combine, enabling each generation of Americans to inherit the freedom to shape their country through the vote, the legislative process, and the general tools of a free society. All of this has been done under the same constitutional government that was established in 1787. What then, when all is said and done, is the Western tradition? It is a tapestry made up of a continuous set of ideas, events, people, theories, facts, experiences, rational propositions, and mystical encounters. It is the development of a certain way of life. Why is it called the Western tradition? Because these ideas and experiences developed in the Western world as opposed to the East. It is not prejudicial. It is instead a way of naming the body of ideas and knowledge that are dedicated to exploring that which is universally human. This diversity is bound together by at least these two things, a focus on what is universally human, on what unites us as the same kind rather than divides us into subgroups, and with a similar experience in each generation, where children learn to appreciate their inheritance through reading the same books and holding the same conversations as their predecessors, but in their contextual moment. There are dangers to be avoided here, the extremes that Aristotle warns us against. On the one hand, there is the temptation to divinize the story, to make of the story of Western civilization a sacred narrative. I went to a high school that fell into this trap. We learned that the history of the West is the history of truth, of the progress of Christianity from Israel westward to Macedonia, then Spain, then America. False. I spent much of college unlearning most of the history I learned in high school. The Western tradition is too complex for such simplicity. It is made up of sinners and saints, ideologues and simpletons, peasants and kings. There are moments of nobility and moments of horror. St. Francis of Assisi, with his embracing of poverty and emulation of the life of Christ, belongs to the tradition. So too does the first slave trader who sold a tribal member into bondage, profiting from the demeaning of a person into a commodified object. The writings of Karl Marx have a place. So too do the principles of Adam Smith. The tradition contains both beauty and ugliness, glory and shame. The other danger is the more present danger and the reason we've taken a Thales Press webinar to work through these ideas. Traditions only last as long as they are passed on to the next generation. We are always only one generation away from traditions dying. Today, <clears throat> the American conversation is filled with voices claiming the Western tradition is responsible only for human oppression and should be replaced. Shakespeare, Milton, Swift, Goethe, Twain, all should be canceled. The very sources of our intellectual flourishing should be cut off. Current movements, Black Lives Matter, the New York Times 1619 Project, and others of their ilk, would ask you to cut yourself off from your roots. In doing so, they misunderstand the nature of roots. Through roots, the tree is nourished and grows. If you cut a tree off from its roots, the tree dies. This tradition is a source of human flourishing. This is where we learn to join Socrates in asking, what is the good life? If we cut ourselves off from these roots, we don't shift to some other source of nourishment. We exchange life for death. What then ought we to do with this tradition? C.S. Lewis offers us a helpful answer in his view of the Tao, which is itself a recognition of the universality of this tradition. Lewis names the Western tradition through Eastern religious terminology. Each generation acts in curation of the tradition. There are things previous generations did that we cannot comprehend. I fail to understand why so many people thought that eugenics was morally permissible. We reject that idea today by and large. And in that rejection, we curate the tradition. It belongs to us <clears throat> to receive the tradition, to cherish it, to cherish it, to curate it, and to pass it on. In so doing, we stand on the shoulders of giants, and we see further by the aid of those who've gone before. This idea of standing on the shoulders of giants is part of why your Thales education emphasizes reading old books so much. We study the works that so many others have found worthwhile. And don't think just because you've read Homer, Virgil, Beowulf, or Hawthorne once that you've gleaned all that can be gleaned from them. If you return to those books in a decade or two, you will find them deeper, richer, and more worthwhile than you expect. 
And when you come back to books you've read before, you are more equipped to mine them more deeply for wisdom, for joy, and for truth. This, then, is the education you have received. You have read the words of wisdom, the stories, the histories. You have been trained in the mentalities required for mathematical and scientific analysis. You are steeped in the axioms and language of the past. Do not despise the day of small things. Your time in the tradition has prepared you to step into the present. Do not despise the things you have studied, but value them. Carry them with you, and they will nourish your soul for years to come. That's it for the uh, lecture portion of today's webinar. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today for this webinar with Thales Press. My name is Josh Herring. It's been a delight to share these reflections with you. Uh, if you want to learn more about the uh, uh, exciting brand of classical education we're developing here at Thales Academy, you can do that by checking us out at thalesacademy.org. And it, uh, if you have any questions, you can email Winston Brady at thalesacademy.org. And do join us on August 25th at 4 p.m. for our next webinar, where uh, Winston Brady will be interviewing Mr. Bob Luddy uh, about entrepreneurship and the mark of freedom. And with that, stay classy and stay classical.